thank you, Mitch, and thank you, Eve, and the entire choir team for always stepping in to help when we ask for help. Let's put our put hands together for the choir. They do an amazing, beautiful work for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are so excited for the opportunity the Lord has given to us today to meet as a, a family of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you are excited to be in God's house today? Let's see my hand. <laughs> Amen. I look forward to every Sunday to come to be with God's people. The Lord is faithful forever. The more we journey through the book of us, the more I realize that when you stay in God's word, you do see the activities of the Holy Spirit all over the pages of scriptures. Many times we tend to diminish the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the child of God. It is very, very important that we realize that the person, the God that is living with us today, guiding us on earth before we go to heaven is God, Holy Spirit. I said, man, how do you know that? We're going to find that one out in a minute. But God, Holy Spirit, is the third person of the Trinity. We have God the Father, God the Son. We usually end there. We don't talk about God the Holy Spirit. He's equal with God the Father. He's equal with God the Son. And he is God himself. And he is the one the Lord Jesus has left for the church to guide the church in all truth. I want to take this opportunity to welcome you. If today is your first time, welcome to First Baptist Church, Stockbridge, Georgia. We are so humble. So excited that you've chosen uh, to worship the living Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So welcome. I also want to welcome our online church family. Thank you for tuning in anytime our church door is open here in First Baptist. In our church, we do honor the reading of God's word. So if you can stand with me, I encourage you to do so. We're coming from the book of Acts, the book of Acts chapter 16, Acts 16. We're going to look at verse 1 to 10. Acts 16, verse 1 to 10. He came to Debbie and then to Lestra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lestra and Iconium spoke well of him, Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decree reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Paul and his companion traveled throughout the region of Phaga and Galatia, having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Masia, they tried to enter Bethania, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. So they passed by Masia and went down to Troas. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready to, uh, at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Father, you are the God of glory. You are the God that leads and guides. You are the God that ordered our steps daily in you. Father, today is a brand new day, a brand new week we're about to begin. There are many plans in our heart. You said a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So, Father, bring all of us in your perfect will. 
We ask you to speak to all of us, including myself today, as we follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit in every area of our lives. May the name of Jesus Christ, the God of glory, be glorified today. In his holy name, we are praying with thanksgiving. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you so much for praying with me. Here, Dr. Luke, who wrote the book of Luke and also the book of Acts, he was a medical physician, a medical profession by his calling. He was not a Gentile. Excuse me, he was not a Jew, he was a Gentile. He wasn't born as a Jew, he was a Gentile. So his writing is directed towards the Gentile believers. That's why if you read the Gospel of Luke, he will tell you uh, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ specifically, his human side. He will tell you Jesus was tired, Jesus would take rest, Jesus would eat, and he will focus more, mostly, of the Lord Jesus' human side. And he's the one who wrote this uh, epistle or letter about the book of Acts. But it's been said that the book of Acts is about the activities of the apostles. If you study very carefully, you realize that it wasn't the activities of the apostles, but it was the activities of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts. If you want to know who the Holy Spirit is, read the book of Acts. And you will encounter every page the activities of the Holy Spirit in the life of the children of God. Today, is the topic is the activities of the Holy Spirit in your life and in my life. Because most of the time, we diminish the activities of the Holy Spirit in our life. So, Pastor Emmanuel, what does it mean? that the Holy Spirit engages us in our lives here on earth. He did it in the history of the church, so come with me, Acts 16. In Acts 16, remember in Acts 15, there was a big issue in the history of the church. For the first time, they don't know whether a person who has placed their faith in Jesus, specifically as a Gentile male, they don't know that the individual male must be circumcised to look like the way the Jewish people are. Because in the Jewish culture, every male born child, including today, will be circumcised, has been circumcised. Circumcision was given to a man by the name of Abraham way in the time of the beginning in Genesis. And that's how God was able to identify his people as holy from the rest of the world, the Gentiles. So now, the Lord Jesus has come to die for our sins. We are born again as we place our total faith in his redemptive work on the cross for us. The question is, does you and I, a Gentile, do we have to be circumcised to become a, a believer, to be born again, to be saved? So the church met together and the Holy Spirit guided the whole conversation and they realized that a male Gentile, listen carefully, doesn't have to be circumcised to be saved. The only way a person can be saved is your total faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, his finished work for you and I on the cross of Calvary, that's his death, burial, and resurrection for us. When you believe in that, you will become a child of God. So the apostles has this powerful, wonderful letter, and they are going around spreading to the Gentile churches as they kept on planting churches. Here we are in Acts 16 on some of their travels, what happened. So come with me to Acts 16. Acts 16, pick up with me, verse 1. He says, he, that means the apostle Paul, Luke is writing to us, so he tells us Paul, said he came to Debbie and then to Lestra, where a disciple, I line that word, a disciple 
named Timothy lived, his, whose mother was a Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. Three things we want to identify. Number one is the word disciple. When you hear disciple, what goes in your mind? Who is a disciple? We are. A disciple simply means a follower of Jesus Christ. You cannot be a disciple unless you are following Jesus. When you are a disciple, that means you follow Jesus. How do you follow Jesus? You need to be born again first. When you believe in the gospel, you accept the gospel as Jesus died for your sins and my sins, you are born again. When you are born again, then you become what is called a disciple. A disciple is fading out of our culture today. Many people doesn't even know what a disciple is. But the early church were disciples. They committed their life and followed Jesus on every area of their lives. So here we meet a disciple. You're going to see him in heaven we are giving his name. His name is Timothy. Everybody say Timothy. Very good. I love the energy in the room already. I love that. This Timothy, we are told where he lived. You and I live in Stockbridge. Some of you live in McDonough. But you live in Henry County. Maybe sometime you live in outside of Henry County. Maybe listen to me online and say, Pastor Emmanuel, I don't live in the United States. But I believe in Jesus. That means you are also a disciple. Timothy lived in a place called Derby. If it was today, it would be Stockbridge. Amen? He lived in a real place, in a real world. Not only do we know Timothy was a disciple, we are also told of his family background. Come with me. Verse 1, we are told that he has a mother. The mother is a Jew. Not just a Jew, but she also is a disciple of Jesus. She is a follower of Jesus. She has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's not all Jews who knows the Lord. Some of them did not believe in Jesus, even today. But this woman, Timothy's mom, was a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only that, but later I'm going to show you that her mother, which is Timothy's grand mother was also a believer of Jesus Christ. But, I want to say but, the father was not. The father was a Greek. Nowhere in the test are we told that the father was a follower or a believer of Jesus. That brings us home. That means you can grow up in a home where one parent believes in Jesus and the other one don't. Or sometimes you can grow up in a home where both parents doesn't believe in Jesus. Or grandparents doesn't believe in Jesus. You know, every time I prepare the sermon, I, my son lives with us now, so me and him, we have Bible studies from 7 to 8. Now you're getting to know my routine on Sunday morning. So it was just me and my son. And we go through what I'm supposed to preach and I, I, we, we, we go through the scriptures line by line and I break it down for you and say, son, you have to thank God that both of your parents know Jesus. Not just your parents, but your grandparents. My mom was a follower of Jesus. My wife's parents, the father is a pastor in the church in Ghana. So both parents follow Jesus. Both of your grandparents follow Jesus. So, son, you need to always thank God for that. Maybe you are hearing me today say, Pastor Emmanuel, I grew up in a home where none of my parents knew the Lord. Or one parent knew the Lord, the other one did not. Well, welcome to Timothy's world. Timothy had a father that did not follow Jesus. And God knows that Timothy needs help as he's growing 
So guess what God did? God is going to connect Timothy to the Apostle Paul. Of all disciples, look at this man of giant of faith. Apostle Paul is going to meet Timothy and Timothy is going to follow Paul. And later on, Timothy will be discipled by Paul all the way to become a pastor of a local church called Ephesus. Don't underestimate the power of discipleship. The Bible says we are to make disciples, we read it this morning, of all nations. Church, we exist to make disciples. That's why we don't give up on people and we have to be patient with people when they come to the Lord as babes in Christ. The father was a Greek, was not a believer. Come with me, please, to 2 Timothy. Put your hand here. Let's go read about, a little bit about Timothy's family. Now that we know him, 2 Timothy, look with me, chapter 1, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, verse 3 to 5, 2 Timothy 1, 3 to 5. This is fast forward. Paul is in prison. He's writing to Timothy now. Timothy is a pastor in a local church. He's a young man and he is intimidated by the ministry and Paul is going to encourage him tremendously. 2 Timothy chapter 1, look with me, verse 3 to 5. I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did. Paul is talking with a clear conscience. As night and day, I constantly remember you, the word you is Timothy, in my prayers, recalling your tears. I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Verse 5. I have been reminded of your what? Sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother, Louis, and in your mother, Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. He didn't say nothing about his father. We don't even know the father's name. When you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you are very important to God. Not only are you important, but God knows you by name. Here, the Apostle Paul refreshed Timothy's mind and referenced his mother, Louis, and his grandmother, Eunice, and tells Timothy, you have a treasure as a growing teenager. Your faith is genuine because it started way back with your grandparents. Church, if you have a grandparents... I know some of you does, or great-grandparents. You see, I never knew my mom's mom or my mom's dad because when I was born, remember my mom had me and my two mother when she was 56. It's the African food, so we'll talk about it another time. <laughs> 56, you heard me correctly. So when we're growing up as teenagers, I didn't get to know my mom's mom or my grandparents. So when you know your grandparents, be excited. I don't know them. Because they were older, and I never met them. But I knew, though, my mom told me that her mom was a pagan worshiper. That means she was a psyche, worshiping false gods. So when you live a life, church, and you have godly parents, godly grandparents, you need to thank God. Because they make all the difference in your life, in your upbringing, and God will use you in the future. Come back with me, please, to Acts 16. So we there, we meet Timothy. We meet his parents. We, knew, we do know that the dad is not a Greek uh, and not a, a, a child of God. Look with me, verse 2. Acts 16, verse 2, going. The brothers at Lestra and Iconium spoke well of him. Okay, that's another thing we need to pay attention to. Look at that phrase, spoke well of him. That means Timothy had a good name in the community. I met some Christians and their testimony is not like a child of God. That's true. Timothy should inspire all of us. He has a good name in the community. 
The question is, when somebody hear your name today, what do they think about your name? One of the qualifications to serve God in the ministry is given to us, if you come with me to 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 3, actually, 1 Timothy chapter 3, one of the qualifications to serve God in the ministry is about a good name. A good name is very, very important. So let's go read about it. 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3, look with me, 1 verse, verse 7. Talking about the qualifications of pastors, including me. Anytime you want to hire a pastor, you need to make sure you do your assignment. And by the way, when I came over here, they did a background check on me, just to give you peace of mind. <laughs> First Timothy chapter 3, look with me, verse 7 only. First Timothy 3, 7. He says, he must also have what? A good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. A child of God, all of us, must have a good reputation in our community. It is scriptural. It is God's word. May God make all of us to have a good reputation. Amen? Please go back with me, Acts 16. So Timothy, we know him. We know where he lives. We know his family background. We also know that he was a good disciple. He had a good reputation. A little bit about Timothy before we find out the activities of the Holy Spirit in a minute. Look at me, verse 3 going. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who live in that area. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. We'll explain that another time. Verse 4, as they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decision reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Whatever you are doing, don't miss verse 4 and verse 5. Give me your attention. If you are listening, say amen. amen. Remember, they are plant planting churches. They are visiting the churches that they planted. They are traveling on a missionary, missions journey. In verse Chapter 15, we are told that a certain decision was reached about going forward how the church should view Gentiles who are saved in the church. They are not supposed to be circumcised. The question is, what was the conclusion of the decision? What decision did they reach? The answer is finally God's word. Come with me to verse chapter 15, Acts 15. Acts 15, look with me, 23 to 28. Acts 15, Acts 15, 23 to 28. We talk about the decisions that the apostles reached to bring to the churches the letters. So with them, they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers. To the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we, are, so we all agreed to choose some men and send them to you with our dear friend Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Salas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. This is what he said, verse 28. It seems good to who? Oh, it's quiet here in this room. It seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Let's learn something from them. That means every decision made in the church must be approved by the Holy Spirit first before we put our stamp on it. Let me repeat. Every decision done in God's churches, I'm not talking about our church, talk about God's global church, must be approved by the Holy Spirit 
before we put our stamp on it. Otherwise, we'll be in trouble. The church said the decision that we are making, it has already seemed good to the Holy Spirit before it seems good to us. The church get in trouble when we go ahead of the Holy Spirit. We will be in trouble. Jesus said when the Holy Spirit comes, he will lead the way. Let the Holy Spirit lead the way. And we'll be okay. It seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us, what did they say? Not to burden you with anything beyond this following requirement. Verse 29, you are to abstain from food sacrifice to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You would do well to avoid these things. Farewell. So this is the letter that they had, and every church they arrived there, they would deliver this letter to the pastor to read to the congregation. Let's find out the result of this letter. Very, very important. Come back with me to Acts 16. Acts 16. I'm not nowhere close. I'm looking at the time. Acts 16, look with me, verse 5. When they delivered this letter, look at the result. So the churches, plural, were what? Strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. Now we have a, a solution. How does God grow the church? Number one, he uses unity. Unity. Whenever there is a division, the church stops growing. That's why we are told to protect the unity of the faith. Satan is the master divider. He starts from the marriage home, between families and children. Anytime Satan begins to divide your family, pray because you'll be in trouble. Do whatever you can as a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ to protect unity among ourselves in every area of relationship. Pastor Emmanuel, how do you know that? I'm so glad you asked. Turn with me to Ephesians, a letter writing to the, written to the church in Ephesus, where Timothy was a pastor of, let's go find out when the Apostle Paul was writing from prison to encourage the church in Ephesus, he's going to speak about unity among God's family. Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, pick up with me, verse 1 to 3. Ephesians 4, verse 1 to 3. As a prisoner for the Lord, Paul is writing, then I urge you to what? Live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humbled and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Verse 3. Make every effort to keep what? The unity of the faith through the bond of peace. Look at that phrase, make every effort. If families will make every effort to keep working together, if couples will make every effort to keep working together, if people in corporate America, between bosses and employees, will make every effort to keep working together, if the people in the church will make every effort to keep working together, we'll have a beautiful world. If our government, let me leave that one alone, we'll come back to that another time. <laughs> Amen? God uses unity. Hear me well, church. God uses unity to bless families. Satan goes after division. Anytime there's a division, let's pray and ask God to unify us. That's the only way God will bless the church. Now I'm about to preach and I got two more minutes to be done. Talking about the activities 
of the Holy Spirit, and that's found from verse 6. Acts 16, verse 6. He said, Paul and his companion traveled throughout the region of Phagai and Galatia. I may have to do part two, I apologize. Having been kept by who? The Holy Spirit. Please don't skip that. As they are traveling, we are told that they've been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. When they came to the border of Messiah, they tried to enter Bethania, but the spirit of who? Jesus will not allow them to. Two places. Now, when I was reading this, I paused. I said, was it Satan or Jesus who stopped them? I didn't see the name of Satan there. So let me help you. Anytime you are dealing and you are walking in life as a disciple, as a child of God, and you have certain doors closed, don't be quick to put it on Satan. It's not. God opens door and God closes doors. I say, Emmanuel, how do you know that? Well, let's go to Revelation, the last book of the Bible. And I'm going to end there because I'm going to have to do part two. Lord, forgive me. I need to do part two. What you gave me, I couldn't finish today. The last book of Revelation, if you're there with me, say amen. amen. You found it 22? Okay, I got some Bible students here in 22. Revelation 1, 22. It means Revelation chapter 22. Okay. Come with me to Revelation chapter 1. That also, I, I know where you're going with that, Terry. Great job. All right. Come with me to Revelation 1. Let's pick up from verse, because of time, let's pick up from verse 8. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord. The word alpha means beginning, omega means the end. I'm the alpha and omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the almighty. Now, skip all the way, come all the way to verse 17. He said, when I saw him, John talking to us, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of death and ages. There's a scripture I'm looking for. It's not here. It says, I open doors and I close doors. That's the God we're talking about. Let me leave you with this as we wrap it up. How do you know God closed the door that you're trying to open? Because we are told that the Spirit of Jesus blocked them twice. To know God closed that door, you will have peace from God. You got to look for that. You will have peace from God because we are told in Philippians 4, 6 to 7, be anxious for nothing, but in prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guide your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. Whenever God closes the door, he'll give you peace. If you don't have that peace, God did not do it. It's Satan who did it. That Satan closes doors, whatever you are doing, don't miss it because I'm going to tell you next week. The doors Satan closes in our lives. And when Satan closes the doors, what happened? Does God sit back and fold his hands or he does something about it? And Father, how grateful we are to you today for the lessons. Lord, we realize today that you have already given us everything we needed in this life. 
Lord, not only did you die for our sins on your work, on our behalf on the cross of Calvary, your death, burial, and resurrection, but you left us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. And the God Holy Spirit is who is in charge of our lives today. Father, help us to be in tune with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to guide every step of the way. Lord, help us to always pay attention around us. The ministry of the Holy Spirit and his leadership. Lord, I thank you today that you place these people in our path. We watch how you connected Timothy to the Apostle Paul. We thank you for the family of Timothy, a godly mother, a godly grandmother. And Lord, I know that there are many, many people listening to the sound of my voice today who are growing in homes, who have grown in homes that there were no godly families, godly parents. But Lord, you still have the ability to save them. Like you saved Timothy. So I pray for that individual in that family that is calling your name for help. When they turn to the left or right, they can't find anybody that they can rely on to teach them God's word. That's why your church comes in. You called us to be disciples, making disciples. Lord, I want to pray for families today, like as we saw in the book of Acts. Because the church, and the letter written to the church was able to unify the church body, you started growing them. Lord, we come against every spirit of division in our church. Every spirit that separate people. May you, Lord, unite First Baptist Church on a common goal. And the goal is to know Jesus Christ and make him known here in our community. And as you lead and as you guide the way. Lord, I pray for your church globally. I ask, Lord, today that you will bring unity back in the church. So that your church can follow your leadership by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for the United States of America that you bring unity back to this nation. In God we trust. May that phrase ring on every state and every county, every community, so that you can send a revival back instead of division in this nation so you, Lord, can work. You're looking forward, Lord, for the whole nation to come under the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you have the power, Lord, to unite us again so we can be used by you as a beacon of light in this world of darkness. May your name, Lord, and your name only be glorified through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We pray with thanksgiving. Amen. If you're here today, say, Pastor Emmanuel, I have a family that I need help with to pray for. There are a lot of divisions in my own family. There's issue going on with my marriage, issue going on between me and my children, issue going on between my children and my grandchildren. There's issue in the workplace. Church, whatever it is, if you're dealing with any division in your life, Jesus is here by his Holy Spirit to help you and I. All we need to do is come talk to him. The altar is open. Shall you all stand? as you all come to the Lord Jesus Christ.